Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon here in South America. Good morning in Asia. And um, it's an honor for us, all of us here today, to honor our master, Dr. Evandro de Oliveira. For some reason, our fate, we, have, we were lucky to cross with okay. Evandro along okay. our life, our okay. fate. And um, he somehow influenced the lives of all of us. Juan Carlos, myself, Musi, Mateus, Vicente. So, what? Um, when I, I, I would like to thank uh, Juan Carlos and also the board members of the Rotten Society for allowing us to to do this special session for Dr. Evandro. And um, and uh, how we did it. And uh, I, I I visited Evandro. And then I, we sat down and I asked him, how do we do like to, you know, to this session to be? And he, and he suggested me, oh, we, maybe we can pick um, some ex-fellows, ex-residents, you know, but we have to distribute, you know, share along many, many countries because he had students all over, you know, Europe, uh, South America, Central America, and United States, so, but there's there were so many, so we cannot fit everybody. You know, it's only limited time. So we he he's actually he did the selection. So we have Jorge Mura from Chile today with us, and we have Vicent Kilis from Spain, from Valencia, with us today. We have Juan Carlos from Madrid, Spain. We have Carolina. You know, Brazil is a big country, so it's like a continent. So we have to divide somebody from Sao Paulo. We chose Alberto Capel, okay? And somebody from the Northeast, we chose Carolina Martins. The she's the secretary of um, Rotten Society. And uh, we also chose uh, Antonio Musi from his hometown, Florianópolis. It's in the Southern part of Brazil. And representing Argentina, we have Pablo Rubino. So we're gathering tonight, uh, today, to honor Evandro. So what we like to do is to introduce Mateus. He's going to be presenting the first video. Actually, why? Because I said, oh, well, ask Jorge to present his cases, Pablo. And I said, well, why, why can't Evandro present his cases? You know, his videos are amazing. So at least one hour for him. You know, his, his, right now he cannot speak very well. So I'm gonna narrate the videos, but the first video who's gonna narrate is um, Mateus. His specialty is the uh, anterior petrosectomy. So can you get started? Uh, oh, the last thing, we are broadcasting live from Dr. Evandro's apartment. That's why I'm wearing masks, this kind of things. So be careful, boss is listening. He's actually listening to all of us. Be careful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Juan. Thank you, Professor Wayne. It's an honor for all of us to be here. Uh, a special session from using our words, Juan, our master, our mentor, and our here, Professor Jolivera. I will show a case that he performed. Let me share my screen. Okay. This case is a pontin cavernoma performed by Professor de Oliveira uh, in 2015. It's a GVMA, 12 year old, a male Brazilian, right handed, that arrived in Professor Oliveira office with one month of dizziness, diplopia, paresthesias on the left side, gay disturbance and falls. Have no previous medical history and on the physical examination have a mute, a six nerve paresis and a mute left side paresthesia. On the MRI, we can see this cavernous malformation that bleeds in the protuberance region on the left side. 
this, this lesion touched the surface uh, around the peritogeminal safe entry zone. And professor decided to, to enter it in an uh, anterolateral view with an approach that we call extended pretemporal approach. That is a, a pretemporal craniotomy described by him with a peeling of the middle fossa and anterior petrosectomy. And you have a straight view from the lesion as you, we will see. Uh, the way he teach for all of us from the lab to the OR. This is uh, my dissection is rotten lab. The way we perform the incision to a pretemporal craniotomy starting anterior to, to the tragus and running to the contralateral hemipupillar line. Again, from the lab to the OR. The same way we train, the same way we apply in the OR. We always take care of the head of the patient. And after doing this incision, we perform an interfacial dissection. And, and then a pretemporal craniotomy as described by Professor de Oliveira. A pretemporal craniotomy as described by him is a, a extended of a, a pterional approach that we release all the temporal pole, letting uh, us to have the uh, pterional, the temporal polar, and the subtemporal uh, view and uh, corridors to work. Same from the lab to the OR. Same as you train the lab, we apply in the OR. After the, the pretemporal craniotomy, we perform a, a peeling of the middle fossa. Professor always like to open the, the dura over the sylvian fissure to drain the CSF and then make the peeling of the lateral of the cavernous sinus. Here we can see V1, V2, V3, the Petro's apex, GSPN, and the middle meningeal artery. After this step, we perform an anterior petrosectomy. Here we can see the limits. We study in the lab, we don't need to use it in the surgery. We need to drill as far as we need. But here you can see the limits, the inferior limits, the inferior petrosal sinus, the lateral limit, the petros carotid under the GSPN. Here you can see the dura covering the internal auditory meatus. And here the dura of the, the posterior fossa. After making it, we start to, to open the dura. You see, we open the dura. We continue from the Sylvian fissure, go under the temporal lobe. Then we have to see the fourth nerve to open the tentorium and then open the dura of the posterior fossa, letting us this beautiful straight view from the protuberance region around the, the uh, apparent roof of the fifth nerve, the peritrigeminal safety entry zone. We see this approach is really beautiful because as Professor Juan said in the words of Professor Oliveira, we have a beautiful approach, not minimal in the skin or in the bone, but minimal to the brain. We just retract the temporal lobe, drill the bone and open the dura and have this beautiful view of the, the protuberance region, the fifth nerve, we can see if we continue, continue our dissection, the petros carotid, the cavernous carotid, the fourth nerve, all the, the, the anatomy of this region. But as professor said, in the surgery, you have to use uh, the approach you need for the patient. As you see in the, this case, he don't need to see the petros carotid, or the other structures. He will drill the petrosapagus as far as we need. Here again, from the lab to the OR, our dissection the lab and exactly what you reproduce in the OR. V1, V2, V3, petrosapex. V1, V2, V3, petrosapex. After opening the dura, the dura cutting the tentorium and the dura of the posterior fossa, we can see the protuberance region and the fifth nerve. In our case, the protuberance region and the fifth nerve. And here 
this lesion touching the surface. Now you see uh, the art of Professor Oliveira performing this case. After the craniotomy, you just open the dura here to drain CSF and start to making the peeling of the middle fossa. You see how gentle his movements. You see V1, V2, V3. Now he continues to open the dura, running from the sylvian fissure under the, the temporal lobe to open the tentorium. Have to find the, the fourth nerve. Now he's looking for the fourth nerve and cutting now the tentorium. Looking for the fifth nerve. Continue cutting the tentorium. Now you see that he needs a little more space. Then he start to drill the petros apex as much as he need. Now he, he drew until the dura of the posterior fossa. He cut the dura. And as we, we planted, he can see the lesion touching the surface and he can deal with the lesion without even touching the brain and the brain stain. You see, he just retracted the temporal log and now he's gently he section this lesion and gently taking it out. You see how this approach lets us to see uh, all the cavity of the lesion without uh, retracting uh, nothing of the, the brain stain. See how beautiful. In the final view of the cavity without any lesion and without any damage to the, the brain stain. Is the post-operative MRI. The patient had discharged four days after the surgery uh, without any deficits. Uh, this is our first case. Again, thank you all, especially thank you, Professor Oliveira, to teach all of us here how to use the knowledge, the anatomical logic, knowledge, and again, from the lab to the OR. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for to, to teach us how to make neurosurgery with art. Thank you. Actually, I'm just giving you guys a few more seconds to analyze the angiography. What do you think about this? This AVM is a um, it's rather compact AVM. Do you have any idea where the AVM is located? Obviously, posterior fossa, but uh, more precisely, it's over the midline. We can see over the midline. This is AP view, and now so on the top, so upper vermis, I would say. Okay, in this kind of AVM. What kind of feeders do we expect? You know, what kind of arteries will be will be supplying the AVM? For sure, uh, branches of the superior cerebellar artery. Okay. And how about this over here? Small branches from pica, and also we have a cortical uh, branches from. Let me remove this cortical branches from pica as well. So basically superior cerebellar artery, pica, and probably not, I'm not expecting to find uh, ICA feeders from here. And the draining, uh, venous drainage is towards the uh, the straight sinus over here. See, you can see here, all right? So this is, that was before embolization. This is after they did a great job, okay? 
and then we can see much better. You see the branches from superior cerebral artery, branches, cortical branches from pica, and probably some branches over here. It's close to the, the fastigium. Okay. So let's see the surgery. So this is a posterior view. We can see this is the uh, hemispheric vein. It's starting from below. And we'll get the branches from the cortical branches from pica first. Why, why can he start from above? Because it's good to have the AVN because the venous drainage is over there. And also if you keep the AVN attached, the gravity will not, you know, you, you don't have to retract superiorly. So you, he started working from below to get the branches from pica, okay? So we are working on the left side and just checking out the, the branches going to the AVM, okay? This will stop at, uh, do you remember the, um, do you remember the, the upper half of the roof of the fourth ventricle? That's the where we are. And now he's moving towards the, the superior part, the tentorial surface of the, the cerebellum. And then he went back to, now he went back to the superior, ten, uh, superior um, tentorial surface of the cerebellum, taking out branches of the superior cerebellar artery that go, that go to the AVM. And also you can see the material of the um, embolization that help that the materials helps a lot also to localize for us to locate, you know, the, um, the to know where we are at the resection of AVM. So it's, it's dissecting around the AVM. And in the end, we can see we got to see the vein of superior cerebellar of the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure. We can see here. So he, he asked me to emphasize the importance of the, analyzing the angiography. And, and then from there, you can have your strategy, surgical strategy. So once again, this is a vein of the cerebellar mesencephalic fissure. This is the um, this is him removing the AVM. Patient had um, cerebellar ataxia, you know, um, for about six months, and then got the full recovery. Nowadays, you know, uh, tip of basilar. Anderson, basilar tip aneurysm seems to be very, um, how do you say? Now everybody's doing, right? That's my impression. Everybody's showing cases, beautiful cases of a basilar tip aneurysm. But um, uh, this case was done maybe 15 years ago. So he was one of the pioneers, you know, after Dr. Drake, after Professor Yashar Gil, Professor Sugita, and um, he was one of pioneers. So we have to keep in mind this video was like a 15 years old. Okay, we have this case, and um, you you can see that the the, the basilar bifurcation is kind of, kind of low. Without looking at, I don't have to look at the you know the the lateral projection to to state to say that this basilar bifurcation is low. Why? Why? Because you can see this. What order is this one? This is a PCA, right? PCA is, has to go up to reach you know, the, the, um, the ambient cistern, okay? This has to go up. The superior cerebellar artery has to go up to reach the tentorial surface of the cerebellum. So that's why I, just by looking at an AP angiogram, 
I can say that's probably this basilar bifurcation is rather low. So, and then we have to check this uh, x-ray, you know, this angel and geography, I cannot see very well the posterior client process. I would guess this might be here. So the basilar is bifurcation is rather low. So let's see his surgery. This is on the, um, this is a Therion approach. He's splitting the sylvan fissure. Okay, this is a right side, the frontal, temporal. This is a right orbit. You how slow, how steady is his movement. Age traumatic, minimally invasive to the brain. Cutting the, the arachnoid membrane releasing, you know, separating the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe as without cutting the veins, you know, try to preserve as much as possible. And now he's opening the chiasmatic system, the, the arachnoid over the optic nerve to free the temporal, the frontal, frontal lobe from the optic nerve. So we'll make it much easier the retraction of the brain. Now he's, now he's working. You see the, the, um, the third nerve over there, trying to release that. You can see the posterior clinoid process is over here. This is a carotid artery. Now it's open in the dura, a posterior clinoid process. Now this he has to drill, drill out this piece of bone. Very careful. You see, he, he, he does not drill like this, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He just follow one direction. And then it bleeds, cavernous sinus bleeds. Somehow he has to stop the bleeding. Now he's removing the rest of the bone, piece of the bone. And then we can we can get we can start looking at the you know the basilar, basilar artery and the branches. Now we have a better view. This is posterior clinoidectomy. Okay. Now he's checking out the the uh, you see the, the opposite third nerve, the white white stru structure. On top of the third nerve is has to be a PCA. Okay, now he's checking that the PCA is right here. This is a third nerve artery going up, and this is a PCOM. He's coagulating PCOM. Why don't he? Why doesn't he coagulate right here? Because all the, perf the all the branches will come off the PCOM at the end two anterior two thirds. Now he has the access to the basilar trunk for a. Uh, the temporary clipping, and then he's tried his attempt to, to clip the inners in there. No, I'm done. I am done. Okay, so if he, you see he's the fenestrate, fenestrate clip. So the fenestration will allow you know the PCA to be free, not included in the clip in the shanks of the clip. Okay, now clipping the aneurysm and his adjusting and removing the temporary clip. You see the third nerve here. He's making stitch to anchor the, the clip, to hold the clip in, in position. I don't know if you, you guys have ever seen this before. And this is, now he's checking. And um, you know, the flow of the basilar bifurcation is usually very strong, usually one clip might not be enough. So this is additional clip. Uh, just to keep in mind, this this was done like 15 years ago, okay? You know, um, 
for um, surgeries of um, anterior, anterior third of the mesotemporal lobe. Probably the best approach, I would, I would say probably, probably the best, most used approach is the Terriona approach. You know, Transylvian, um, just like what Professor Yashargil advocated, okay? The posterior one, probably you can come from behind. The problem is in the middle third, it's difficult to reach from front and difficult to reach from behind. So if you do the subtemporal, one of the alternative, one of the alternatives is why don't you come from from here? Just go that's the shortest shortest the distance. So why don't you go subtemporal subtemporal approach? Uh, one of the problems right here. Can you tell me what problem would that be? You have to retract the temporal lobe. And what's the problem with that? You know, the complex of vein of Labe and other veins that drain to, that drains to the, the you know, the uh, transverse and sigmoid sinuses. So you, you can get uh, venous infarction if you rupture those important veins. Also, you can see the shape of the tentorium. The tentorium is like this, tent is higher medially, lower laterally. So you have to do something like this, subtemporal and then go up all the way to this region, the, the middle third of the, the mesotemporal region. That's something very difficult to do. So you have to go low and then go up and then vertically go up to up to here. So uh, Actually, this one was approach was advocated by Professor Yashargyu and then uh, used later by his successor, which is uh, Professor Yone Kawa. But uh, interestingly, interestingly, in 2012, on the same issue of journal of neurosurgery, there was, there was a paper from Dr. Evander's group advocating the supracerebellar transtentorial approach and also there was a paper from Professor Ture on Turkey uh, describing the same uh, similar approach. They were on the same issue of a journal of neurosurgery that month, March, 2012. So now I'm presenting a case located in the temporal lobe. That's the approximate middle third of the temporal uh, middle third of the mesotemporal region, the AVM. We don't see that much of the nidus because this AVM is rather, uh, is um, more like a fistula of type, a fistula type of AVM, okay? But it's located at the basal surface of the, the, the mesotemporal lobe. So we have the um, MRI over here. So for sure, this is a PCA. So the basal part of a temporal lobe, it has to be uh, um, supplied by the branches of the PCA. And also the inferior temporal arteries and also the paroxypital artery. We're gonna see here. This is the surgery. This is a positioning of the patient. It's a rather long straight incision because he has to expose Way, way, way superior to the ineum, external uh, occipital protuberance. Here's this, here is after the dura opening. Now he's dissecting carefully direct the thick arachnoid over, you know, just the, uh, the uh, at the level of um, cerebellum mesencephalic fissure. So now he's coagulating the tentorium. This bipolar seems to be very nice. With irrigation, you can see, cell irrigation, very nice. And now you have to coagulate well and then you have to have this very nice support of anesthesiologist to keeping the, the venous pressure a little bit positive. So the vein will bleed instead of air coming in, the blood will, will go out. So now he's exposing cutting the tentorial to expose the, 
the very large amount of the, the basal surface of the temporal lobe. Okay, now he's removing the tentorium and then we are at the level of the AVM right now. As I said, um, this uh, type of AVM is rather, is um, more like a fistula. So he has to coagulate the branches, the arterial branches, and keeping this draining vein. So every, every feeder, arterial feeder, that go, that go to the AVM will be coagulated. And obviously, you have to maintain the, the, uh, the, the vein intact. So, now it's working around the AVM, around the vein itself. This position is very tiring with the, uh, you know, the upright position semi-sitting position is very tiring. We all know about this. Now he's just coagulating around the, um, the AVM. And the feeder, this is a parietal occipital artery. Continue to cut the arachnoid, identify the feeders, coagulate the arteries, keep the veins. In the later stage, coagulate the veins. You, see, you can see the arterial feeders, mainly from the, the parietal occipital artery. Now continue to, to cut small feeders. How do you know this? This, the feeders of this AVM because uh, this is at the, the region of the parietal occipital sulcus. So the branches are from the parietal occipital artery. So as to working from lateral to medially because the, 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 the venous drain is towards the, um, the deep venous drainage system. So he's keeping the artery intact and, uh, and coagulating small feeders. And this is, this is parietal occipital artery. Very steady hands in this semi-sitting position is, is not easy. So still coagulating around the, from lateral to medially around the AVM. As I said, it's like a fistula type of AVM. So not much of the nidus. We're not talking about nidus. We're talking about fistula. To continue coagulate, you have to have very nice uh, bipolar forceps. See him working around. He says, he always says, he's, for him, it's very clear, you know, the pathological, uh, the sick small branches, is, he can easily identify which small branch is sick, which small branch is the normal one, which one is, which one belongs to AVM, which one belongs to the normal brain. And also it's easy for him to identify which is artery, which one is the dilated vein that um, will take some, some time to, to get this kind of experience. So continue to work around the AVM. Small branches can be, has to be coagulated. And uh, the main artery, the parietal occipital artery has to be preserved. You can see just coagulating branches coming off the uh, parietal occipital artery in the going to the AVM. And now, finally, the vast majority of the branches came from the parietal occipital artery. But he already knew beforehand because this region corresponds to the uh, parietal occipital sulcus. And then final stage of the surgery.
and the removal of the AVN with uh, preservation of the uh, the product civet artery. You see there. This is a final aspect of the uh, after the surgery after resection. 